Okay, so let's, okay, so indeed I am Dave Evans, that's me. I am the co-founder of the Life Design Lab at Stanford University. What does that even mean? How did we get here? So let's start with who, I mean, um, who is this guy anyway? Right? I mean, so, I mean, um, so how many of you um, have actually either like seen any of the videos or read the book or, okay, about some of you, and the rest of like the coffee's free, so just come, okay. See, um, so like, so, so where did this come from anyway? So, you know, increasingly now, there are rooms filled with people who look like that teaching this class, or taking a class called Designing Your Life at Stanford. You know, and then we have this book that's um, that's all, so, which you know, enough to understand on the book. Um, I mean, I'm sort of known as the kind of the cheerful, bouncy Tigger guy on the team. You know, this I talk this fast all the time, even though I've had coffee. Um, and um, the, but I was the skeptic on the team, so I said, you know, for two years I successfully killed the book project. You know, because I told my partner Bill, I said, this is stupid. Nobody reads books anymore. I mean, um, <clears throat> how many of you have a large pile of things next to your bed on the nightstand that you feel guilty about not reading? Yeah, that's great. It's called books. Those are called books. Uh, they're little guilt boxes. You know, you just pass them out to friends, then get read. You know, um, I said we could do something interesting. And after two years of not doing that, I finally failed in killing the book project. Um, and so now, 350,000 copies in 23 languages later, in a year and a half, apparently I was wrong about that. Um, so something's going on with that. So where did this come from? So where did this come from? Let's take a look at that. Um, so the story is like is, is as follows. Um, you know, once upon a time, a long time ago. You know, when I'm like 19, I'm 65, I have five adult children, I have seven grandchildren. Anybody here got more than seven grandkids? No, I win again. Okay. The, um, <clears throat> anybody here, <laughs> how many here have a kid even? Yeah, okay, maybe a third of you. Okay, that's right, yeah. yeah but um, very few of you are even old enough to be my child, you have to understand. Um, you know, <clears throat> I'm that old. So once upon a time, I'm 19 years old, 1973, something like that. I walk into the Career Development Center at Stanford University, where I'm an undergrad, and I ask the following question. I kind of go, okay, so can you guys help me? And people like Deb work there, you know, and they kind of go, oh, we love to help you. We're very helpful people. I go, that's great. So the question is, what do I want to do with my life? And they kind of go, yeah, what do you want to do with your life? And I kind of go, right, that's the question. They go, no, no, what do you want to do with your life? I kind of go, I don't know. They go, oh. That's a problem. I, kind of, I know that's why I'm here. I have a problem. What do I want to do with my life? That's what you're here to help me. They go, no, 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 no. You, you figure that out, and then you tell us, and then we'll help you go get that. I go, I know how to get stuff. Getting stuff's easy. It's knowing what you want. That's hard. They kind of go, well, you should know. You know, um, and I go, so criminally negligent in being helpful. Crim so, you know, the, the university, criminally negligent, you know. Um, so then I go to, to my mom, you know, my dad died when I was a kid. Um, and ask her and the very loving people who care about, you know, the bridge ladies, and all that, can you help us? And, and they're useless to them. They're very caring, very empathetic, and useless. Uh, uh, then I go to the church, you know, and, and then it gets worse because now I get spiritually, get, well, you know, well, um, well what, what do you think is God's will for your life, Dave? Well, well, well I don't know. I, you know what, have you, what have you heard, Dave? Have you asked the Lord for guidance? Sure. Um, what have you heard? I kind of go, How, yeah, how's that work? What's the hearing thing about it anyway? Like, have, have you like heard stuff? How do you hear stuff? You know? um, and, they, and, then, and then in the 70s, we, you know, we, were, we were actually better at guilt than even now. So you, you get this line to go, well, Dave, if you feel far from God, who moved? <laughs> Probably not God, Dave. You know, so great. So now I'm clueless and being beaten on with sticks by people who don't know how to be helpful. So this is, there's massive criminal negligence going, going on in the church and the university, you know, and lots of young people wandering around feeling guilty like they're supposed to know stuff you couldn't possibly have known by now. So we're like really, really bad at this. We're really bad at helping people become themselves. Um, that's where this starts, right? Now, it's a, that was, you know, way, way, way long ago, almost 40, 45, 50 years ago. And so I start, and I happen to be a Christian person, so I think I notice this little fact. Pretty much the biggest thing everybody on the planet is doing or has ever done is what we call work, mostly during the day shift, mostly for making enough money to make a living. Uh, but there's also people who work at night and who, do, who work other than for making money. But everybody works. There's more work going on than anything. And these, these Christian people told us, well, your life is really valuable. We know your life's really valuable because Jesus died for it. So your life's really worthwhile, and God really cares about you. And then the simple observation is the biggest single expression of that human life you've got is this thing called work. So if you matter, work's got to matter. So if you matter to God, work's got to matter to God. And so I go to the God people. I go to all the, you know, the laymen, you know, you know, the elders in the church, and kind of go, what's this got to do with anything? 
And they are clueless. They're just doing this church stuff, you know. So uh, that's where this begins. Uh, and I spend years, because I know they're all lying. I just knew intuitively they're all lying. It's a conspiracy to aggravate people under 30. <laughs> Have you noticed the conspiracy to aggravate the heck out of you? I mean, don't most people my age make you nuts? Um, they, they still make me nuts, but I don't even get along with my peers. The, um, I was, you know, I'm just upset now. I was insufferably difficult when I was in my 20s. Um, so the, the point was, I was quite convinced that the Christian story included a deep, rich answer to the question, how do you figure out what to do with your life, and where do you spend it, and does it matter? And the, and the answer is, that's all absolutely true. Uh, in fact, the reason I'm in Chicago this week is there's this big thing called the Faith at Work Summit. So 500 worldwide leaders of the faith and work movement, you know, of which Global Research and Tommy Lee are a part, uh, you know, are getting together and talking about that. Well, 40 years ago, you could get the entire group into a Volkswagen, you know. I mean, um, <clears throat> all four of us would sit there and talk to each other. Uh, so we're having this conversation. So along the way, I did figure it out the hard way. It's much easier to do now. Uh, so we jump forward a couple of decades. Um, I have been doing, so I've been, you know, doing youth ministry on the side, and I've been teaching in churches on the side while developing a high-tech career as at Apple in the early days. I co-founded Electronic Arts, and I started doing management consulting, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I noticed I had not been around, you know, college-age people, high school-age people who I really like a lot, had always been mentoring and teaching with uh, for a long time. And I went out to have a conversation with people about, hey, what's going on with young adults now? This is my, like, my 40s. And uh, I was teaching a Bible study of young professionals. Um, in that Bible study, <clears throat> at one point, we were in a conversation, uh, they're all working people, kind of like you, and, and I said, well, as Luther said, sin boldly, as a response to a particular question, doesn't matter what the question is, and they all kind of go, what? I said, well, as Luther said, sin boldly. And they go, Luther never said that. I go, yeah, he did. In fact, he said it in print. Um, so, and, and these are Wheaton grads, these are, these are people, you know, who, who know Christianity really well, and I'm surprised at how incompetent they are at the reformer's history. So I said, look, you know, let me get some background for you. We're going to do another lesson on the Reformation. Um, so I went and started doing some Google research on the concept of sin boldly. And by the way, how many of you knew Luther said sin boldly? Okay. Clearly we're doing something wrong. Forward, you. that's great. Um, he did. Uh, by the way, um, and that's a whole different talk uh, we haven't got time for. It. But nonetheless, and then I found this book online by this guy, you know, Dave uh, Williams, who's at uh, George Mason University. Um, he's a prof. He's not a Christian. He's a philosopher. And it's actually this book, you know, Sin Boldly, Have the Audacity to Write a College Paper in which you actually tell the truth about what you think and still expect to get a decent grade, uh, as opposed to emulating the professor's opinion and they'll think you're smart because they agree with you. Um, and so he writes this book, <clears throat> and we get in a conversation about young adults, so I contact him. He's an interesting, a very strange guy. Um, and we get talking about how do you help young people figure out what it is they want to do with themselves, because he does that on the side as a college prof. We had this long conversation, um, and one day I was shooting an email back to him, um, and just as I hit the, uh, and I was thinking about what he was working on, because at this, this time I'm a full-time management consultant, um, and I said, well, this is an interesting question, but if you're Dr. Dave, which is the name he goes by, you get to think about this stuff all the time, because you're spending all your time working with college students. Um, and I said, well, wouldn't, wouldn't that be kind of neat? And then I hit the return key. And as soon as I hit the return key, uh, what I noticed was a little breeze went across my face. And I looked up at the window, and it was closed. And I went, that's weird. Then I went, ooh. And I go, is that you? I don't have a lot of unusual experiences like that. Um, but I sat at my desk kind of going, so what's going on? And then I noticed that I had burst into tears. And I thought, oh, apparently something is going on. Um, and it started with that little phrase running through the back of my mind saying, well, wouldn't that be neat? I.e., wouldn't it be neat to hang out with college students a lot more than I get to these days? Um, so I started going around and having conversations. I had you know, cups of coffee in the morning and cups of beer after work with everybody I knew that was hanging out with young people to find out what's going on. And along the way, one of the people I met was a guy named Randy Bear, who ran a place at the UC Berkeley called Westminster House, which is a, a, a Christian-owned, no longer is, unfortunately, a Christian-owned dorm, been there for 100 years, on, on the campus at Berkeley. And he said, you should teach a class. You should teach a class on this stuff about how to figure out what to do with yourself. You know, that thing you've been talking about on the side for 30, 20 years. 
I said, that's a great idea, Randy, except for the following. Number one, I don't have a PhD. Number two, I'm not on the faculty. Number three, I don't know anybody on the faculty. Number four, I have no curriculum, I have no class to teach. And number five, it's a horrible drive to Berkeley from where I live. <laughs> Other than that, it's a great idea. It's a great idea, Randy. And then Randy goes, I can solve all those problems except the drive. Will you do it? Eh. Okay, I'll give it a try. So I started teaching this class. The first class I taught at Berkeley, which I thought I'd teach once, and 14 semesters later, apparently it kept going, um, called Finding Your Vocation, subtitled Is Your Calling Calling. And we did that for a long time, but along the way, you know, then I had another cup of coffee with a guy named Bill Burnett. So that's the guy on the couch right there, who's the executive director of the Stanford Design Program. But he had been that in that role for about 10 minutes. Um, so he had been running design firms. He'd worked at Apple actually after I had years later. Uh, we knew each other from the business world a little bit. And now he's running the design program at Stanford. And Stanford's not quite as bad a drive. Um, so I called up Bill and I said, hey Bill, let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm curious what you're gonna do now that you're a full-time educator as a business guy. And I shared with him what I was doing at Cal and this issue of, you know, we spend all this time in the college world helping people learn stuff, but get no effort whatsoever and helping them figure out what to do with it. Um, and I thought this is a kind of a strange idea uh, that would take a year to explain. And we're five minutes into the conversation and Bill goes, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a huge issue. It's ridiculous. We should totally solve that problem. I know. We'll start it this fall. We'll prototype it this summer. But just reformat all that stuff you teach through the lens of design thinking, which is a great way to do this thing. I need a proposal by Monday. I got to go. <laughs> so we did that. So a couple of weeks later, we started teaching at Stanford. And that's how we got here. So and then after we taught at Stanford, just to design students how to become the designer you want to be for about a year and a half, two years, uh, that guy, Lance, from the Career Center, again, the same Career Center that completely failed me 30 years before, um, walks over and says, couldn't you do this for everybody? All the students want to figure out what to do with themselves, not just designers. Um, and actually, Bill goes, no. And I said, yes. And then Bill goes, well, yes, all Trump's no. So Dave's wrong, but that's fine. It'll, we'll watch him fail. So yeah, sure, we'll give it a try. Um, and then we start teaching Designing Your Life to everybody. Um, and now the thing is blown completely up. Then we wrote this book, you know, which has now gone nuts. Um, so that's how we got here. So part of what's going on in Resource Global and in these ministries is the integration of faith and work. So for me, this whole designing your life thing began with answering the question, how do I integrate my faith and my work? And it turns out design thinking, which you're going to hear about in just a minute. So what I'm not going to do fairly quickly is give you a quick overview of what is this designing your life thing, the way we teach it at Stanford, the way the book describes it which is rooted not in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's rooted in the gospel of human-centered design called design thinking. And I'll tell you along the way why those two things not only get along great, they're almost the same thing using different words. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the where this is, that's with that guy, then, then my partner Bill Burnett, who by the way happens to be a Nietzschean atheist. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> so we sort of span the worldview domain a little bit. Um, so the Life Design Lab has the mission of applying the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at or after the university. And if we double click on the colored words, you can get a white paper, that's kind of the technical answer. The simpler version of that is we're the guys teaching courses to help you figure out what you want to be when you grow up. Now, how many of you are kind of like, yeah, I really would like to get that growing up thing done. I'm really, I can't wait to get done growing up. I'm really up for that. Nobody wants to, one, okay, well, yeah, it's a bad idea because once you get all done growing up, you get to be a really cool thing, which we call dead. You get to be dead when you're old. Um, <laughs> Because you don't want to get grown up. You know, what you want to do is you really want to help people keep figuring out what you're going to become next because you're never going to stop doing this thing, right? Um, now, that's what we do. And we say it that way, you know, pretty much everybody kind of goes, ooh, can I take the class? You know, and then we say, and then we said, well, write the book. And we wrote the book, and, we, and then the book became a New York Times bestseller, much to my surprise. You know, and then people like you fill up rooms. We've been on the road nonstop, talked about 10,000 people in the last year um, in person. And so what's that all about? Why, why is that happening? Why are people in this conversation? Why did you get up early before work to do this? I mean, the coffee's fine, but it's not that good. Um, well, because people are stuck. <laughs> and why are people stuck? They're stuck because of what we call dysfunctional beliefs. Psychology calls dysfunctional beliefs ideas that either simply aren't true or don't generatively get you anywhere. And they're very popular. There's lots of them. Let's give you a couple. They probably relate to business people because they tell me you're business people. Um, first of all, what's your passion? Who's heard this question or asked it in the last two weeks at least once? Yeah, great. Terrible question. Okay. Um, and it's not just what's your passion properly pronounced. It's what's your passion? What's your passion? Are you passionate? Is this really, are you, is this, you know, is this really wonderful? Have you found your passion yet? 
This is the single most common you know, life organizing question in the cultural meta-narrative at this time. What's your passion? It's all about finding your passion. Here's the problem. The research makes very clear eight out of ten people answer the passion question one of two ways. I haven't found one yet. I'm hoping to. Or, which one did you want to hear about first? I got a bunch. How many of you are one of those two people? I don't know, or I've got a couple. Right? Okay, the rest of you are lying. All right. The, um, um, no, but that's about 80% of people. This question believes stuff. Questions all have belief systems. Before you decide a question deserves to be a life organizing question for you, better check its belief system and make sure you agree with it. This question believes that, number one, life is always organized around passion. Number two, everybody has one. Number three, you can find your passion before you've even begun li living into it. And number four, the world will probably let you do it and make a living at it. By the way, none of those is true. Watch what you wish for. Uh, <clears throat> so thing one. Thing number two, success will make you happy. Right? Very common thing. You know, sort of old school thinking, except it's still around. People are just pounding their, their feet toward success. Um, that will make you happy. And that's sort of you know, one of the many categories of dysfunctional beliefs that are these formula for the way the world works. Let me tell you how it is. Particularly, you know, most of you are you know, under 50 or certainly under 45. Um, let me, young man, young woman, let me tell you the way it works, right? Uh, and there's lots of versions of this. So there's, you know, you know, success will make you happy. You know, there's, you know, just make VP or CEO or IPO. You just, you just hit some, some three-letter acronym, you know, um, and you will be successful. You'll be happy. You know, um, it's like a formula, you know, for in our world, you know, it has to be with going to school, right? So I teach at the business school, among other things. So just go to the right business school and everything will be fine. Or just marry the right person, find the right house, you know, join the right startup, whatever. You know, just, just fill in the blank and everything will be fine. And none of those things are true. I mean, they're good things, but they're, they're not going to make you happy. So it's time to think differently. This is where this design thinking stuff comes up. So what is it? that we're doing with this design stuff. We're going to think like a designer. So the best way to understand design thinking, how many of you ever either heard or had any training in design thinking? You saying, oh, about half of you. Great, okay. How many actually been trained on it? I think you know it. Cool, all right. So the best way to understand design thinking is to know what it's not. Um, design thinking is just a tool. David Kelly, the head of the group the, uh, at uh, IDEO, will say, you know, it's just a tool in your tool belt. It's a way of thinking. Lots of ways of thinking. So, um, there's engineering thinking, where you solve your way forward. In engineering, you understand what are called tame problems. A tame problem is a well-bounded problem with clear success criteria that does not change over time. You, know, you want to build a bridge, you know, it works the same every single day. I mean, bridges don't wake up on Thursday and go, you know, I'm just over it. I'm, I'm so, so done with the stress thing. I think I'm going to fall down today. That would be upsetting, you know. Um, <clears throat> So that's the, that would be more of a wicked problem. You know, so engineers, when you've got enough data, you've got enough equations, you know what you're doing, it works every time, it's great. Um, uh, <clears throat> then you have business thinking. We've got business, a bunch of business people in the room. And in business, you know, you're never done and you're never right. There's literally no such thing as right in business. There might be winning and losing and more and less, but there's optimization. You can get better. You know, and if you actually go to a snazzy business school, you can get better quantitatively. You know, and you can say oxymoronic statements like the science of economics. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's psychology with, the, with money attached, right? Um, but the point being, in business, you can have figures of merit, your return on assets, you know, even customer engagement, whatever it might be. But do they ever love you enough as a customer? Have you defeated your competitor strongly enough? You know, have you identified your optimization of your resource utilization? Have you simplified your supply chain well enough? You're never done, but you can get better and you can optimize. So that's a way of thinking about the world. Um, you can do research now at Stanford. We do a lot of research, and research is a very, very formal process. How do you invent knowledge that wasn't there before? The process for that goes all the way back to the academy founded by Aristotle, you know, in Greece. Think about, you know, we, you get a PhD in chemistry. You're a doctor of philosophy in chemistry. I mean, what thoughts do molecules have anyway? What's that? <laughs> why, why, why are you a philosophic person? You're a philosophic person because you're in the legacy of Aristotle you know, and Plato, that's why, uh, which most academics don't even know. But we have a very formal way, an analytic process of creating new knowledge. And these are really, really powerful ways to think. But there are a whole class of problems they don't solve. We call wicked problems, a term actually invented by urban planners back in the 70s. Um, because when you're inventing a city, it's kind of a mess. You, know, you can't pick up Chicago and go drop it on St. Louis and expect it to work. 
The solution's not repeatable. These are problems where the success criteria are unclear. You don't know what success is until you found it. Once you found it, it's never repeatable and it'll change on you again. There are human problems, that human messy problem stuff, particularly human problems related to inventing a very important thing that we're all responsible for and totally incompetent at called the future. We're trying to invent your future, the world's future. So when we do that, we build our way forward. You can't analyze the future because it's not here yet, but you can build your way into it. So we build to think, we draw to think, we do to think in design. We don't analyze, we don't optimize. So that's the approach, the most important thing to understand. Um, so we define design in two ways, one by a process, these five steps. We've been teaching it this way for a long, long time. We start with empathy. First, really understand what's going on. You problem find before you problem solve. Most of the time stuff fails is because you're working on the wrong thing. You know, so people are working on the wrong problem almost all the time. Um, then once you really understand what's going on, then you go into the definition phase where you actually define your point of view. You don't have a point of view until you've deeply empathized with what's going on. By the way, do you hear how Christian this is? You can't love them until you understand them, right? I mean, God, God loved people so much he decided to actually put skin on and get really, really empathetic. Um, you know, so, so there's a profoundly, you know, oriented... Uh, way of seeing the world, and then you define your point of view. You're being formed by your compassionate response to the situation in which you find yourself. You know, and you figure out what problem you're trying to work on for what reason, and then you start having lots of ideas, you start getting really creative in order to prototype your way to the future. We prototype, iterate, prototype, iteration. So, you know, non non judgmental ideation and prototype iteration are probably the two most critical elements of what distinguishes design thinking as a developmental process from other approaches to, to things. Then only after you've gone through all those steps do you test stuff and actually visit it on the outside world. Now, there is a step we always do in design. We make it very clearly, explicitly uh, understood when we're talking about life design, which is step zero, which is accept. You, know, you have to start where you are. Trust me, if it all comes out happy, it goes through a place that looks just like right now. You cannot solve a problem you're not willing to have. You, I'm sure, not in the group, but maybe have friends who keep talking about the same thing over and over again. They're kind of complaining or whining about it a little bit and nothing changes. And you realize what's going on is, you know, it's not really their problem that's the problem. It's their problem with their problem. And if you've got a problem with your problem, that's a problem. Because you can't fix it. And a lot of people are stuck wanting to be in a situation that's different than it is. And all the cool solutions relate to reality, so we've got to really accept reality. Design thinking is also a mindset. It's a way of seeing things in the world. Um, and it starts with curiosity, and then, which means we're really going to lean into the human energy of, ooh, that's interesting. And everything is, if you look at it from the right point of view, which will take you into radical collaboration, which doesn't mean collaborating in a radical manner. It means radically broadly. You have to hear from every point of view. You're going to leave nothing out. If you do that, you will end up reframing things. You will have a new point of view. You will reframe the way you think about stuff because you've been deferring judgment until you're much more deeply informed. You do that keeping mindfulness of process. When am I making judgments and narrowing my field of view? When am I not judging and going broad? When am I flaring and focusing, we would say? We have real consciousness about that, managing the process. And when in doubt, do something. Bias to action is probably the strongest one. So we're curious people who like to do stuff. That's what designers are like. Now, so that being said, I'm going to give you in like 10 minutes time to, um, a couple of ideas. You know, we teach a 10 week, 20 hour course in small groups. You know, where there's a 21 module online version of this course and I've got about 10 minutes. Uh, so let me just throw a couple of ideas at you pretty fast. Um, am I talking too fast for you, by the way? Good, because I'm not going to slow down anyway. But they I just <laughs> wanted to know if you were offended. The, um, so the first thing is connect the dots. And the dots you want to connect are these three, which is who you are, what you believe, what you're doing. We call it living the coherent life. If you can, Interconnect those dots. Who am I? What do I believe in? What am I doing? Your chances of experiencing meaning making, according to the psychological analysis, goes way up. You know, we actually have an exercise to do this. So let's drill into this. How many of you would like to have your life be meaningful to you? I mean, like, I, I want to live the nihilistically meaningless life. I really don't give a rip. You know, I just came for the food. I mean, I, I've had a couple of nihilists take the course, and they're really interesting people. Um, you know, I'm like, why? But anyway, um, so most people would like this to be true, but this is true of people across the board. I mean, that's not just religious people. Uh, I mean, religious people have been kind of doubling down on the meaning-making thing for a long time, but everybody wants their life to matter to them. So how do you get there? Um, now, first of all, this thing about meaning has been around a long time. Even Freud, so we'll go way back to Freud, who I'm not that fond of, but nonetheless, he was not well known for short answers to questions. Freud was never known for as a short answer kind of guy. But when asked, how could one be happy, 
he had a very short answer. He said three words, Leben und Arbeit, love and work. If you've got love, you've got the human thing going on, you've got work, you've got something to do in the world, you're probably fine. That's about as short as an answer as you're going to get. Uh, from <clears throat> now you go to Viktor Frankl. Um, a Holocaust survivor wrote uh, you know, Man's Search for Meaning. Very fam- How many of you have read or heard of Man's Search for Meaning? Okay, fabulous book. Um, about half of it's his Holocaust experience. Half of it is his whole new idea about psychology that he comes up with called Logotherapy. Logos, meaning making. That uh, human beings are fundamentally meaning making machines. And if you can't make meaning, if you can't make some coherent meaning out of your life, you know, you're going to have an incredibly diminished experience. That's what he observed for the people who survived in the concentration camps during World War II. And his conclusion was the meaningful life can be made meaningful one of three ways, through love, achievement, or suffering. You know, through relationships, through getting things done that matter in the world, or if for some reason, as is true for many people, circumstances allow you neither of those, you are oppressed, you are held down, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can even suffer well, and that's a humanizing experience. But people have been answering this question for a long time, so now it's a big field of research. So there's, there's, um, that, that's um, Michael S- uh, Steger uh, at Colorado, uh, one of many people who's now full-time job is researching meaning making, not the meaning of life. Michael will tell you that's somebody else's job, that's like the priest's job, but the meaning in life, that's a human experience we all share. And one of the observations is meaning making comes from, you can read just fine, you know, people experience meaning when they comprehend themselves in the world, understand their unique fit, and can identify what they're trying to accomplish in their lives. And if that isn't what psychology would simply characterize that in the faith-based world we call the integration of faith and work, I don't know what it is. Um, But the whole point being, who am I, what do I think is true about the world, and what do these two things have to do with each other? So we actually have an exercise that helps you do this. You want to have a meaning-making experience, you need an ordering point of view and self-awareness. What do I think is true about the world? What do I think is true about me? How do I connect those dots? You can't connect them if you can't articulate them. You know, and don't forget, to do that, you've you got to figure that out. So we have a, an exercise called the compass exercise where you write down your life view and your work view and figure out whether or not you're living integratively or not. So working on that is something that you can do. Um, so let me run through a couple more ideas. That's thing one. Thing two, do odyssey planning. This is kind of the centerpiece of our work in terms of the actual exercises and, and doing life design, so to speak, um, which brings us to yet another dysfunctional belief. My personal favorite, you know, which is, are you being the best you? Are you, are you being the best you? Are you sure this is really it? Is this it? That, like, are you, you're not suffering FOMO. You're not, are you not settling? Are you settling? God, we don't want to be settling. Whoops. Uh, now here, I want to double down on this thing. So here's the thing about the best version of you. Um, this is a very popular idea, and it's nuts. It's totally dysfunctional because of the nature of the word best and what we mean by this. What, what do we mean by are you being the best you? See, the word best has a very specific denotative meaning. It means that against a series of alternative possibilities, you can apply one set of objective criteria fairly and equally and understand these alternatives through the lens of these criteria and assess them one to the other and know how they rank. So I can look at option one, option two, option three, and I can you know, score them numerically or one way or another and say option one is a 65, option two is a 72, and option three is a 49. Clearly option two is the best one. So the word best works just fine in an appropriate place. But here's the problem. We're talking about a human life here. Now, actually, things have updated since Deb's I saw the bio. I'm on my sixth career now, actually. Um, you tell me what's better. My grandfather self, I have seven grandkids. My educational reformer self, I just came from a conference where I'm telling, I have a master's in you know, thermal sciences, and I'm telling a room full of educators how to run their colleges. So I'm now an educational reformer. My grandfather self, my educational reformer self, or my social impact entrepreneurial executive coach self. I just spent two weeks in New York with a room full of social impact entrepreneurs. Which one's better? You can't get them from here. They don't compare. And it's not even as simple as like apples versus oranges. Those are even like sort of come from the same part of the store. It's like apples, frogs, steel. (laughs) What's better? Frogs or steel? Quickly. You can't get there from here, right? By the way, when I say that very often, engineers go steel and the biologists go frogs, you know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but it depends where you're coming from. Life is like this. 
So the reality is we notice every single human being has more aliveness in them than one lifetime will permit you to live, i.e. there's more than one of you in there. There are lots of good yous. There is no one best you. I even can argue that point theologically. I want to go into a full you know, Christian point of view. You know, is, is there one single best version of you that God has in mind and everything else is second fiddle? No. I haven't got time to explain all that, but this is, this is true across the board. By the way, this concern, this worry, this kind of, you know, wonderfully awful longing for the best version of me is incredibly common. It has nothing to do with a religious point of view. Everybody wants the best thing. It's actually kind of an attractive idea to believe that there is one really amazing, totally awesome, as though it actually was true. You know, I mean, count the number of times you say totally awesome in a day. It just can't be that awesome that often. You know, it's like, how is the elevator? Totally awesome. It was a totally awesome elevator. You know, the buttons went in and out. Um, <clears throat> but if you were actually experiencing it that, there isn't just one you. There's lots of good yous. And you won't even know which one it is until you start living into it. Which brings up a question, by the way. Um, how many lives are you? Wait time we actually don't. We can do a little exercise to come up with how many different versions of you could you live into? And on average, you know, we hear people, you know, somewhere between seven and a thousand, but it's pretty much never one. We're all going to die leaving a bunch on the table, and that's okay. That's the good news. So forget FOMO, fear of missing out. Of course you're missing out. If you're not missing out, you're just not paying attention. There's lots of ways you could live. And you're only going to get to one. Now, you can do different things, like Deb was saying. You're probably going to have multiple careers, but you're going to leave so many things on the table. And that's really good. That's a great, that means you are a capacious person in a target-rich environment. You're a human being in an interesting world. Of course you're not going to get done. There's way more than one thing, which means, you know, you've got to figure out how to figure that out. So the reframe is not just one of you. There's lots of great use. You know, never too late. So get the odyssey of life continuing. You're, not, you're never done. Keep it going. So when we actually work on this and we talk about planning your future, well, you can't plan your future. You can only plan your futures because there's more than one of you. So we actually do an exercise called the Odyssey Plan, where on a single piece of paper, we have you figure out three completely different versions of the next five years of your life. Um, in 12 minutes, by the way. Um, and everybody does it just fine. You know, people often start like, what? And then they do great. Uh, because the truth is, there's a whole bunch of ideas in you. For example, you know, this actually is, I'm, I'm emulating now a young man uh, who isn't, that isn't him, and his name isn't Alan, but I'm going to call him Alan, uh, but it actually was a Kellogg MBA right here in this town. Uh, about two years ago, I had this conversation. I said, Alan, you know, let's come up with three versions of you. And he goes, no, 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 I have one version of me. I don't have two more ideas. I don't need two more ideas because I know what's going on, and you're already bothering me. Um, so what, what is it, Alan? What are you doing? Well, I'm going to go into consulting in the medical industry. I've already got a job in a, in a management consulting firm specializing in the medical industry. It's a very special firm. It's a very elite firm. I'm very thrilled to get the opportunity. I know exactly what I'm doing. We're done here. I said, no, 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 Alan, I've got bad news for you. Um, the consulting industry just died. All the CEOs got together last night and agreed we're tired of spending all this money on expensive invoices to learn stuff we already knew followed by no implementation, i.e. the consulting industry. Yeah. The, uh, I was one for 20 years so I can throw my, my own tribe under the bus. The, um, you know, we're, we're not doing it anymore. Uh, consulting's over. You're a Kellogg grad, you've got an MBA, you're unemployed, that's embarrassing. What are you going to do? And he goes, God, I mean, if I couldn't consult, no, you can't consult. What are you going to do? Oh, um, I'd be a strategy, a strategy guy inside a large media company. I think, I think high-tech media is really cool. I don't really know much about it, but I just think it's really, really cool and it's taking off. So I'd be an inside strategy guy in a media company. I go, great, great idea, Alan. Uh, and then one more, Alan, the wild idea. What would you do if money and regard were no object? If I could promise you you'd make enough money, not a lot, but enough, um, to do that thing you love but don't talk about in public very much, um, and nobody will laugh, what would you do? And the real guy, whose name is not Alan, uh, said, do you promise they won't laugh, Dave? Do you promise? I said, yes, because I'm in charge of the universe. I promise nobody will laugh. Um, uh, what is it, Alan? He goes, oh, I would do boutique wine distribution. I'm kind of a wine guy on the side. You know? um, and he thinks that's embarrassing. But I've told that story dozens of times, and so no one's ever laughed. I mean, so, there, so I said, Alan, did you notice 35 seconds later, you have three ideas about you. You just didn't know you knew that. You all have many more ideas about you than you think. Now, what do you do with those ideas? Go make a decision about how do you live your life? No, you have ideas for the sole purpose of prototyping them because you haven't had any experience yet. You have to sneak up on your future. So the way we do prototyping and design uh, looks like this. Um, <clears throat> that's the most, the most important step, prototype iteration. 
So we prototype in order to ask interesting questions, expose our assumptions, collaborate with other people because you never do them alone, uh, which allows you to sneak up on the future. Many people think of prototyping the way, because the word prototype means a lot of different things. In what we call late stage engineering prototypes, the purpose of the prototype is to test it to make sure it works. Before we put this engine on an airplane full of people, let's put it on a test rig in a cinder block encased box, you know, spin it up to three times normal speed and see if it blows up or not. And that's the prototype test. If the prototype fails, it broke. You know, if it succeeds, it works fine. That's not a design prototype at all, because that prototype starts with, I already think I have the right answer, and I'm proving to myself that it works. In design, we prototype when we know we don't know what we're doing. We're going to go ask a question we can't get an answer to anyway, other than empirically through experience. So we're always, all prototypes that we run in design fail, i.e., they don't work. Their job is to teach you something, not to be the answer. So we're going to go try stuff. Just because you can't think your way through it, you have to live your way through it. Which means a good prototype of design is cheap, fast, and has the sole purpose of teaching you something. As long as it teaches you something, you're good to go. Now, how do you prototype a life? I mean, when I was developing you know, hardware and software products and technology for 25, 30 years, you know, it's lots of prototypes. Um, but what is a life prototype? It comes in two forms, a conversation or experience. It's really simple. Go talk to somebody who's doing the kind of thing you're thinking might be interesting and get their story. It's not a job interview, it's not asking for money, it's not asking for help, you're not getting anything from them but their story. Because most people's favorite topic is themselves and what they do. So what you're really saying is, okay, so you're Tim, right? You're Tim? So Tim, as it turns out, you know, I've done the Google research and you actually are the most interesting guy in the world. So we have this shared interest. You think Tim is really cool, I think Tim is really cool. We should get together and share that common interest and you could talk about the really cool thing we both love, which is you and what you're doing. You know, I'll pay for the coffee, we'll do it at the place of convenience for you. Um, would that work for you? Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Tim, for playing. The, um, um, now, I wouldn't say it quite that sycophantically, but close, you know. Um, and by the way, it absolutely works. Um, so you can get that story. And then eventually, not just hearing stuff, but doing stuff, doing the ride along, doing the visit, you know, showing up in person, finding ways to prototype <clears throat> will get you further than sitting around thinking about it or trying to analyze it. Now, where do you prototype? How do you come up with what to prototype on? through our favorite mindset, which is curiosity. So I'm Alan, and I look at these ideas, and I go, Alan, you know, well, what about this media thing? I mean, you know, you're more interested in that than you thought you were. He says, I'm not sure I want to make that move. Of course you're not sure you want to make that move. You've got to prototype it first. So what do you do? You look for your curiosity. Your curiosity will tell you what you want to lean into, because then you can do it authentically. So I ask Alan, what are you curious about? In the media thing, he goes, well, you know, the technology is unusually cool. I'm not really a gearhead kind of guy, but I think the tech is really cool. Uh, and I said, well, hey, you know, do you think you could find gearheads? Are they willing to talk about their stuff? You know, can you get, you know, the guys who read those magazines to talk about what the latest camera looks like or what the latest media mixing thing? It's not at all. How do you know a gearhead? They're not hard to get talking. Um, so I said, that's a really easy conversation to have, especially if you buy the beer. Um, you know, it's not a hard thing to do. What about the other one? He says, well, you know, when I think about the wine thing, he says, it turns out, you know, you can actually go out into the field. It turns out if you go to the winery tours, you go to the wine country, not just do you taste it, but you pay the expensive tour, and they'll take you out into the vineyard, and you, I did it, I did it, and you can touch the grapes, and you, grapes are fuzzy. I had no idea. There's a whole bunch of grapes that have fur on them. Um, and I had no idea. I got to talk to workers in the field, and it was just a completely different experience. You know, so I, you know, touching it is not the same as talking about it. Not that hard to do. Lean into your curiosity. Okay. So the last thing I'll talk about is uh, choice making, because no matter what you do, you got to make a choice, right? Uh, and so, how do you know when you know? You know? How do you know? So we came up with a process, looks like this. For the four steps of choosing are to gather and create options, narrow them down to a manageable list, make a choice, and then of course agonize whether or not you did the wrong thing. Um, no, you don't want to do that. You, know, you don't want to agonize actually. What you want to do is let go of the options you're not using and move on into it. Um, I haven't got time to go to this in all detail, but let me zoom in on one or two facts about this process. So <clears throat> if I jump to a gathering create, how many feel already you've got so many choices? You know, yeah, there's a lot of that going on. So narrowing down, uh, narrowing down, understanding how your brain works is kind of important. So for instance, if you're like this guy, you know, you 
overwhelmed by jam. There's too many jams in the world. There's a famous Columbia jam study. Um, this is a true story. You know, and they went into a store and put up the specialty jams, put out six jams, and watched to see if anybody came by and even looked. And about a third of the people in the store stopped. So 40% of the people in the store looked at the jam. Now, do you think any, anybody bought anything? No, yes. Some, actually, about a third of the people look and about a third of the lookers buy. So 40% stop, 13% buy one of the six jams. Wait two weeks, come back, do it again, same table, two of them actually, 24 jams. 24 jams. Now, here's the question. Do more people stop or fewer people stop? Who thinks more people stop? Fewer. Right. 50% more, 60%, 60%. Way many more people look. Why? Because you walk in the store and go, oh my gosh, look at all the jam. It's a jam a day. There's a bajillion jams here. This is so terribly cool. Now, anybody buy anything? No, 3%. So 50% more people look, nobody buys anything. Why? Jam overload. Your brain can handle four to six items. When you have too many choices, your brain freezes. So what you have to do is you have to narrow the list down. What you do is you cross them off. If your list is too long and you're stuck, but Dave, what do I cross off the wrong one? Don't worry, don't worry. After you cross it off, you'll know. It's the pizza Chinese effect. Friday afternoon, 1 p.m., you're sitting at your desk, somebody goes, hey, Dave, we're gonna go get some lunch, you wanna come? Oh yeah, I haven't eaten yet. Well, we're gonna get pizza or Chinese, haven't decided, do you care? I really don't. Okay, let's go, we're gonna go get pizza. No, 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 no Chinese. <laughs> at the last minute, you knew Chinese, right? After the fact, you're, now by the way, the part of you that knew it was Chinese, wasn't holding out on you when they first asked you the question, but you don't know until you've actually got through the experience of making a decision. So don't worry, your own wisdom will save you. Now, uh, and on the choosing thing, I'm just gonna mention, so this is Don Goleman, the guy that invented that term. He's been making a career out of talking about emotional intelligence for 20 years. Um, it turns out there's a place in your brain near the basal ganglia, he calls the wisdom center, where the memory of what works and doesn't work for you is stored. And the tricky thing is, so the wisdom, the part of your brain that actually stores your experience does not speak in words. It's part of the ancient brain. It speaks in emotions and intestinal response, gut feelings. The mistake people make is they think inarticulate is unsophisticated. Your intuitive understanding, your gut understanding is not stupid, it's just inarticulate. You have to learn how to listen to yourself. Now, it's not the only thing to listen to. I'm not saying only go with your gut but you want to be able to develop a sophisticated approach to what it is that you're doing. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna jump ahead. Um, I'm gonna skip, actually you can do it the hard way, I'm gonna skip right to the end. So we have a little time for questions because we started a little late. So, boom. Um, before I did, I covered R, simply connect the dots from our mini making, give yourself more than one alternative because you're not just one person, prototype your life, try stuff, don't just think about it, you know, and choose well, you know, then you're on your way to, you know, to a well-lived life, you know, gee, is that all there is? Well, no, of course, there's a lot more, uh, and I answer this not because I'm selling anything, but this question always comes up, and, and people still, can I take the class? Well, actually, you can now, so you can buy the book, you know, um, 17 bucks on Amazon, whatever, you know, you, uh, and the website has a ton of free stuff you can download. So the website is just the book with a dot in it, Designing Your Dot Life. Um, and can you take the class? Yes, there's actually an online version of the class now, a 21 module, eight hours of material you can do online, you know, in groups or by yourself, you know, just swipe your Visa card, whatever, and you can finally take the class. Um, so the reason, I'm, the only reason I'm here is Bill made me do this. So Bill said, we have to give uh, an answer called yes, not no, to can, can you help us if you're not one of the only 17,000 people we teach at Stanford. Um, so that's how we got here. And a little bit of a story about how I got here, which leaves us to, okay, um, why should you trust this will work, number one? It, you know, we've done this with thousands of people. This actually is research-based. We, you know, we don't do you know, alternative facts at Stanford. We actually do like real facts. Um, <clears throat> And so I had two PhD studies on evaluating the educational pedagogy, which have come up very positively, you know. And it's the first time we've actually used human-centered design. The whole point is to de develop things that work for real human beings. We finally turned the power of human-centered design on designing ourselves. And it works out really, really well. Um, so if we're trying to be more human, that might be a little more helpful and leave people a little more hopeful. So as you, as everybody out there is trying to become, you know, all kinds of, you know, cooler, you know, cloud-based and connected, and, you know, and God forbid we don't have enough kale each day, you know, um, what we're really just saying is could we be a little bit more human? 
That's all we're trying to help people do. And by the way, from a Christian point of view, becoming fully human, Jesus has described it in a variety of ways, including as the second Adam, the second creation of what a real human being looks like. Um, so a person who's fully loving, fully compassionate, fully present, and fully in alignment with the reality we know by the name of God. That's what it means to be a human being. So being a little more human is a really good idea, we think. So with that, I've got some time for some questions. So you got uh, any questions about either, you know, how we got here, the, the, the faith undergirding of this thing, how to implement it, how to apply it, what issues I didn't discuss. Any questions at all? This morning, yeah. Yep, on my sixth career, right? So how does designing your life fit into have you found that there are necessarily different spans of time that you did this again five years from now, you right. find three totally different trajectories, or how does that work? Yeah, so how does that work? How, how do you make the moving around thing? I'll, I'll tell my students, you know, look, uh, you know you're gonna have a lot of jobs, but if you actually knew you're gonna have multiple careers, you know, I mean, completely different experiences. Um, does that change the way you think about the present? If you know you're going to get to do more than one movie, um, and, it, and it absolutely should. Um, changes happen essentially one of two ways. Big changes happen one of two ways, inside out or outside in, right? So outside in is, you know, you get fired, the industry ends, what have you. So my first career, which was in the advanced energy technology field, right, um, ended very quickly after four years because the industry didn't exist. It was very hard to go to a party that was not being held. Um, they didn't put into my master's program the note that said, by the way, the world doesn't care about this for the next 35 years. Um, you know, I was doing stuff way before there was any market for it, so I tried desperately to go be an advanced technologist for a market that didn't exist. Um, so I gave up. So that was an outside-in change. Then inside out changes are like you just start noticing stuff that's true about you that you want to live into in the world. So I mean, literally, I did exactly what I described for you as the process to end up becoming an educator. I have a master's in thermo sciences and a 20 year career as a marketing guy in hardware and software, high technology, and a management consultant. Clearly, I should teach college. I mean, give me a break. Um, so what I leaned into is talking to a bunch of people who are hanging out with people between 18 and 32 years old and how, how, how are those guys doing in the you know, 90s, back in the 90s, you know? And somebody said, well, hey, what if you taught a class? And I said, well, I'll do it once. It's a terrible drive. You know, I tried this one little prototype. I, I just gave Monday afternoons pro bono to the world of education, hung out with students at Berkeley for half a day on Mondays. You know, I had no billable activity on Monday afternoons. You know, and now, you know, I, I run a large, well-funded lab at Stanford just by following into those things. So, so the way those big changes happen very often um, is in small bits. Uh, the dramatic moves of quitting your job and doing it, it's pretty rare to just like, you know, you know, take this job and shove it, jump, you know, grab the parachute, jump out the back of the airplane and land in Cirque du Soleil. Ta-da! You know, that's, um, we're not in favor of that. It's not the way it usually works. But people mostly shift into things they've already had an interest in a curiosity. Curate your curiosity, and then you can move forward into it. We got asked to do the, what's the book in one sentence? You know, I was about to go on to the, the three, the seven minute live interview on the early morning, you know, news show in Canada. Uh, and they got behind this, the assistant producer grabs me, he goes, Dave, we're down to three minutes. By the way, we're gonna open with, we need the book in a sentence. And Bill and I go, dude, we're like college professors. We don't do one sentence answers. Um, it's a 300 page book. And he kind of goes, oh, well then you're off the air. And I go, give me a minute. Um, so, um, <laughs> just said, okay, I got it. Um, designing your life is get curious, talk to people, try stuff, then tell your story. So if you remember anything, just remember that. Get curious, talk to people, try stuff, repeat until engaged and tell your story. Um, that's the generative process. So if you keep doing that, um, some big changes will probably come along the way. Kind of a long answer, but a really good question. Yeah, what do you got? So curious, for the students you've had, yeah. and you've seen them kind of progress from this, what's true of those who continue to design things? Ah, okay, yeah. So, so does it work over time, what have you? Um, yeah, no, it just fails miserably. They, they just graduate and crash like everybody else. The, no, um, yeah, we hear about, we have tons of anecdotes. We don't have the money to do longitudinal research in psychology. Long-term behavioral analysis, like 10, 20, 30 years, is really valuable, hugely expensive, uh, really hard to do. So we don't have any formal long-term research. We have before and after stuff, but we get a lot of anecdotal calls back. And absolutely, over and over and over again, um, because the one job you know you have for the rest of your life is finding your next job. I mean, you're, you're never not gonna have that job again. You gotta reinvent yourself over and over and over and over again. 
Um, so it turns out this idea of design thinking, and by the way, design thinking is just a rebranded version of what we originally called back in 1963, we've been teaching this since the 60s, it was invented at Stanford, um, called human-centered design. Many of you have heard of human-centered design, but there's a bunch of design work going on here in Chicago. Um, we spoke at Chicago, how many have been involved in Chicago Ideas Week? Ever done the Ideas Week? Yeah. So we spoke at Ideas Week when the book first came out. Fabulous stuff going on here in Chicago. It's a really, really innovative city. Um, <clears throat> but the whole thing about human-centered design is most, I say 98% of the time, it's 50% understood. Because people think the word human in human-centered design just applies to the user. Let's have very user-oriented products that are very human to use. I was the world's first mouse product manager in 1979, so this is going to be a user-friendly computer for the first time ever. You know, so it's all about the user, and that's totally true, and it's half the story. The other half of the story is let's humanly design it. Human-centered design is how do humans have ideas, collaborate, think, you know, turn stuff into reality. The machine shop where we teach people how to actually cut metal and wood at Stanford in the engineering lab uh, is called the product realization lab. With a high realization, we make real things here. How do you realify something, right? So you turn those ideas into reality. So the human-centered design piece um, is how do people actually work to make things that people can actually use. Uh, and so the humanness of that process and the way we turn that human thinking into tools that apply to life planning and, and career, what we call a, a conscious competency in life and vocational wayfinding. We're all making this thing up as we go along. Life is a long improv skit. You can't not make it up as you go along. But you can get really good at making it up. There are better people who are better at improv than others. Uh, and so life is an, a long improv skit. We're just giving you improv training. So it, we hear back a lot that it works over and over again. One or two more questions, and we, we probably got to get you to work. Yes? Yep. Okay, so, there, um, so, it, so do design thinking and Christianity get along? Yes. In fact, not only are they compatible, I would argue that design thinking is intrinsically Christian. Uh, so if you want the long answer, there's a 13-page white paper called The Christian Companion to Designing Your Life, which I wrote up, that gives the complete doctrinal explication of why that's true. And I'll give it to Tommy, and Tommy can get it to anybody who wants it. It's free, just, you know, drop it off. Um, so the short version of the answer is, do Christianity and design thinking get along? Yes, because that last thing I said, Look, um, Christianity is a, doesn't think of itself as an idea in the religious space. Christianity is a description of a series of behavior. First of all, Christianity doesn't deserve to be a noun. The early Christians didn't call themselves Christians. That was a, that was a slang nickname. It was like the N-word, frankly. Um, they called themselves followers in the way. You, you, you aren't are a Christian, you do Christian. It's a thing you do. It's a way you behave in the world. And you live into an understanding of reality that is in alignment with what you think Jesus was saying because he apparently lived in a way that was more in alignment with reality, including the transcendent existence of divinity, than anybody else. So if that's really true, let's go there. So it's just called living in the truth. Um, it's, not an alternate, it's not an alternate reality. It's just the reality fully described. And if what I want to become is a good human being, so if I'm trying to become fully human, anything that moves me accurately toward being fully human can't not be Christian. It may not use overtly religious words, right? So in church, I might say, are you living faithfully? And you'll know what that means if you're one of the people who has the code words and knows the handshake. Um, at Stanford, we say, are you living coherently? It's the same thing. Um, so uh, Christianity and design, and we're supposed to be lived persons who go and do things uh, as God continues to reveal God's self, right? If you happen to know the story, the first public ministry miracle that Jesus did was turning water into wine. That story, whether you think it's true or not, that's the story. And in that story, Jesus wakes up on that day, gets dressed, puts on the good clothes, the nice toga, you know, you know because he's going to the party, you know, and he thinks, I'm still not coming out yet. He wakes up that morning thinking, I'm not yet going public. And he goes to bed having gone public after having a conversation with his mother. He was surprised by virtue of real-time discernment. Life unfolds in front of even the guy we call perfect. It probably unfolds for you, too. So this empathetic discovery, try it, learn as you go along, integrate over time, and grow into your next self. That's exactly what Christianity is trying to support you to do. 
Paul says, we see through the glass darkly, but later face to face, metaphorically meaning we're all on our way to eventually, you know, union with the truth, and it's going to get better and better. It's supposed to be heaven all the way to heaven and hell all the way to hell, allegorically. Um, so if we're trying to grow into our full selves, how do you do that? It's an intrinsically empirical process. You are embodied reality, intelligence-bearing beings. You're not a brain on a transport system. That's a dualistic Greek understanding cosmologically. I'm going down the philosophic pathway here. But Christianity argues that you are a life-containing embodied intelligence. Christianity thinks you don't understand the reality of the cosmos unless God metaphorically puts skin on or intrinsically an embodied-minded relationship with reality. God looks at creation in the story of Genesis and says it's good. This world isn't a world they'd be gotten away from and go hide in heaven, like get out of here as fast as you can. It's a fabulous place. You're supposed to engage fully. That's the Christian story. And God loved you so much, he even allowed you to participate in it by letting you do this thing called working. How cool is that? You actually get to have a job like God does. God works and you get to do work too. Isn't that fabulous? This I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. What a wretched idea. No, it's all about becoming fully human and fully alive. If you become fully human and fully alive, you probably can't help but sort of trip over the God thing along the way. So design thinking and Christianity work great. Don't get me started. Okay, um, you kind of did. Do I have time for one more? Yeah, one, one more. Okay, one more. Yeah, what do you got? Uh, so, uh, like you said, uh, the starting part of the whole design thing is Yes, get curious, yeah. Uh, uh, but for my own experience, like, uh, people in my life, uh, instead of uh, asking, what's the meaning of life, we, we all we all to ask, uh, how can I get a better heart? Right. Instead of, you know, asking the whole answer question. Sure. And also, in the university, uh, students, I mean, kind of other students, instead of uh, thinking, how can I be an outstanding student, Right. So my question is, uh, from your experience, do you think people nowadays they are more uh, inclined to ask the authentic question, the right question? Right. Or yeah, are people just trying to succeed, or trying to trying to win the game, trying to you know get the bigger job, get the bigger, make more money, or you know have the cute girl like whatever it is, you know, or or, or ask the authentic, deep questions about living a meaningful life? Um, you know, I think both things are accelerating rapidly at the same time. So people going for a rich, full, authentic, deeply human experience, and people racing to surface satisfaction are both both growing really fast, usually in the same person at the same time. You know, we're a mess, okay? I mean, it's a very, I don't know about you, there are like six guys in my head, we have meetings, you know, we get together. I just facilitate the conversation. Um, seriously. Um, and um, you call it schizophrenia, I call it friends. You know, the, um, so on the authentic, first of all, there's um, um, one of the challenges in the educational world, one of our colleagues, Denise Pope, works on this at the education school at Stanford. Um, it's called doing school versus learning. There's a philosopher and theologian called James Carse. Um, uh, who wrote a very interesting short and kind of weird book called Finite and Infinite Games. And finite games are games where you play by the rules in order to win, and infinite games are games where you play with the rules in order to keep playing. Now, they don't all come in perfect couplets, but for instance, school is a finite game, and, in, and learning is an infinite game, right? You know, dating is a finite game, and love is an infinite game. Now, not every one of them comes up in a perfect pair. But it's very easy to get distracted with playing just finite games to win. Um, and then you end up on what's called the hedonic treadmill. Because when you do a quit, you get an A, or you get the bigger car, or you get the raise, it really feels great. Two, three, four, and then you're back to where you were. All the studies make very clear, people who either lost their legs in a car wreck or won the lottery about a year later are about exactly as happy as they were before that either horrible or wonderful event. External circumstances in and of themselves that affect your hedonic or eudaimonic experience of positive emotion, i.e. happiness, don't have a long-term effect. So human thriving is supported by quite a broader set of things. So one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing at Stanford and, and trying to help people broadly, not just in the church, um, are because 
a better answer to the question, how could I build a well-lived and joyful life, as opposed to just go pursue that stuff that makes money for the people who are selling it to you. You know, getting a better answer to the question that's more acceptable to more people, you know, gives that hopefulness a little more traction. Um, so I, I'm both encouraged and terrified. Um, but the current upcoming generation, millennials and iGen, um, are more purpose-minded than any generation we've seen for 75 years. You know, so I, I virtually, now I'm selective because I only talk to people who already are interested in their lives. You know, people who could care less, of whom there are many, don't talk to me. But the people who care, mostly really care, not just like, hey, I, I've had one, exactly one Stanford student walk up to me and say, look, Dave, let's be really clear. I'll, and I'll just quote, I, I just don't give a shit. Okay? All the, I, all, I really don't, I just want to make a bunch of money. Now, what I need to know is, will this class help me? <laughs> I said, sure. I said, you can pick any value to live into that you want, and you can, live, you can do a totally coherent, incredibly self-serving, rapacious life. And these tools will assist you. Uh, you're welcome to take the class. It's a free country. But by the way, I have one suggestion. Maybe just keep an open mind while you're having the conversation. You know, and so at the end of the course, I said, so, John, what do you think? And he kind of goes, yeah, I'm still going to make a lot of money. I could probably do good things to do that, though. That might even be more fun. <laughs> you know, so we just show up and do the best we can. But, you know, you'll notice, I mean, you're in charge of you. It's your call. Thanks for your time. God bless you guys. I know it's 9 a.m. You guys are running out.